waiting. Okay. Well, shit, I guess we're live. What's up, everybody? I'm Dust from Track Days, talking motorbikes. Episode tonight is with the Horsepower Rodeo dude, Ryan. What's up, dude? What's up, man? It's good to be here. It's good to see you. Good to actually connect. Yeah, well, you know, my Taco Bell internet fucked us up last time, so... Taco Bell internet. Okay. I mean, yeah, yeah. box Chick-fil-A, you know? Yeah, whatever. I mean, uh, it's something that one of the other podcast dudes, uh, Chris, the show Simcoe from uh, Pin the Gas. That's what he refers to when his internet's trash. Yeah. It um, happens to the best of us though. So yeah. yeah. I mean, right. dude, like I've, I've got that like frontier fiber optic at the house, like two gig fiber to the house. And dude, in the last three weeks, it's gone down twice. Oh, and you know, obviously, I had to reschedule one podcast, right? So, but whatever, it seems okay now. So, I think we're gonna be, yeah, I can hear you it. great, man. I'm glad yeah. to be. So, tell me a little bit about um, about yourself. Like, you're you're a writer, I guess. What, what do you ride? Yeah, ride or writer. Which one are we talking about first? Motorbikes, dude. Motorbikes, this is talking yeah, motorbikes. motorbikes. We're not talking about TV, man. We're talking Perfect. about motorbikes. I was like, you know, I was taking two wheels, set. a seat, and a throttle, man. With, you know. <laughs> so I my I wanted a bike so bad when I was a kid and my mother, um, my dad always rode. My mother said, no, you're not getting a motorcycle. She actually um, said that I wasn't allowed to get a motorcycle until I paid her back for raising her, me. Okay. Um, and then I kind of ignored that. And when I was 19, I bought a Yamaha TDM 850. It's a little sport touring bike. I actually bought it from the guy I trained martial arts with. Um, okay. I had a, a weird long story about that. It was basically I bar a, a friend borrowed it, never returned it. Okay. And um so that bike that bike went away i'm actually going to do some videos about that and see if i can actually reconnect with the missing motorcycle that went missing 20 years ago 20 years ago yeah yeah it was like 2000 i was around around the time i moved to la around 2005 um, i was moving to la i wasn't sure if i wanted to ride a motorcycle in the city so i lent it to a friend who's going through a tough time and uh, he never returned it yeah. so right now i ride it's just a little cbr 500 double r or whatever that little yeah, it's it's a little commuter bike. It's commuter good bike. Go in between traffic. You know, I had a commute for the last few years of like seven miles and it was through the equestrian park in Griffith Park. Oh, OK, so I, yeah, with, I, I rode my work. bicycle through there. Yeah, yeah. So it's just a fun little ride. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you go up and over the garbage pail and then go to work with that or. Yeah, something like that. I don't okay. it's, it's uh, I'm, I'm in Glendale. OK, and so I would just kind of hop over the hill and go through the equestrian park. So it's it's. Uh, it's kind of a fun little thing. It's a little underpowered. It's not a race bike. I don't do any track days with that thing. Yet. But, yeah. I mean, so. it's hard to it's hard to be a local to me and not have me scumbag you into coming out and ride the track, bro. I know. I know. You definitely need to come ride the track. Like you're... I have to get out there and do I want to do more track stuff. I literally haven't done very much of it. Um, yeah. And and I like that's I would love to get into that more. It's it's a weird thing when you do what I do for a living. You're like. You have all the money and no time or all the time and no money. It's very rare that I have money to blow on motorcycles and track days and the time to go do it like simultaneously, almost impossible. You know what, man? I think um, you're not in a really unique situation, bro. Like, I think everybody has that weird ebb and flow where, you know, some days they're sitting on like a lot of cash burning a hole in their pockets and um, other times they're broke as a joke. Yeah. Like, that's where I'm at right now. <laughs> yeah same 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 we've had we've had writer strikes and uh and work stoppages so i'm like i just, yeah. need, to make, I just need to make a little money like literally about, it was like a year and a half ago i came this close to buying the um the triumph 765 the moto 2 edition okay. i wanted to get into more track days i found one it was a really good deal in Simi valley i went yeah. over and looked at it i almost bought it and i was like ah let me wait a little bit um I'm glad i did in retrospect because it's been a little bare, but I, yeah. I, I would have liked that bike. It seems like a little bit of fun. Well, I mean, you know, I don't want to like try to sell you shit on the show, but I mean, I'm about to ditch the, uh, or sell the 2023 track days Yamaha fleet. So, oh, wow. you know, I mean, we might have like a bro deal on an R1 or an R7 or something for you, man. Like, okay. Well, we'll have to talk. We'll have to. Yeah. Talk. Yeah. Like it's we could talk, we could talk that shit offline, but like whatever. Yeah. But yeah, yeah like, um, you know, it'd be hilarious. I mean, you know, I'm just, I hate to do like a commercial, but it's my fucking show. So who cares? Yeah, you can do what you want. Um, so like April 26th next month, um, we're at Button Willow, dude. We've got, uh, we've got a pretty epic thing going. So like, you should, you should come, man. Uh, you know? what, April, what would you April say? April 26th. Okay. Oh, yeah, call, call in sick, dude. I'll write you a note. 
yeah, call in sick. I'll call in sick to myself. I work for myself too. <laughs> yeah. So um, you mentioned that you were confused on whether I asked you writer or writer. Um, so that's what you are. You're you're a writer. Yeah, I uh, write television. I've written television for about 12, 14 years. Um, okay. Uh, I started out on a little show. I was on USA Network called Burn Notice. It was a spy show that went about seven years. Wow. And okay. then we did a show on NBC called Blind Spot that went about five years on NBC NBC's for about, about okay. 100 episodes. And then I just finished, just off camera, there is a signed poster for the CW show Kung Fu from the cast. That's the last oh, show. Shit. Kung Fu? There, there's, a new, a, there's a new Kung Fu. It was a reboot. So it was a reboot of the original series in name only. Oh, okay. Like well, that's what that's what it do. usually is. Yeah, right? that, and that's they they bought you know uh, somebody still owned the IP for it, and they've been trying to develop it for years. A friend of mine um, would develop the show, and she was like, "If this show goes, I need you on it because I've studied martial arts." Um, oh my god! I have a really big stunt background as far as like shows I've oh, been on. Like, yeah, I've shot stunt units all over the world. I've blown oh. up stuff in Iceland. Um, we did um, uh, samurai fights in Tokyo and. Um, oh, we shot, in, we shot in Machu Picchu, you know, so like, and we did the motorbikes in Barcelona. Really? We, um, uh, what was that? It was just a quick little motorbike stunt. It, it got, it, it got rained out. So it was really, it was pretty difficult to do anything cool there. But, um, um, it was actually interesting. We were shooting on set in the middle of Barcelona and we have a motorcycle that's just kind of going to come down the road and park. And this guy was on a, it was like a BMW, like enduro bike. And, uh, we're getting ready to shoot the scene and about 500 motorcycles come rolling right through our set. And I can't remember who it was, but a GP rider had passed away. A Spanish GP rider had passed away and they were doing these tribute rides all over Spain. And we just happened to be in the middle of one. No shit. And so I have this video from us on set trying to shoot our show when about 500 motorcycles just ran through and just, revving the engines and waving at us we all the cameras out there and everything and they're just like yeah hi we're coming through wait for us it's pretty cool though yeah i mean i um like i i just think of barcelona and i daydream about it because uh, oh dude it's it's super good and um you know lily and i went there uh, a couple years ago when jake did the wild card at portobello mm -hmm. so we did like a racecation you know, yeah, like the way you scumbag the wife into coming to a, the race weekend is to be like, no, but we're going to spend a week in Barcelona before and then we're going to go and hang out after. And that's kind of what we did. Yeah. You know? Barcelona is maybe my favorite city in the world. I mean, I have a lot of favorite places in the world, but yeah. um, Bar I was in Barcelona like last year. I went to the Portugal Grand Prix at the beginning of. Oh, Black no shit. I was in Portimao, just happened to be in Portugal. So I was like, well, I have to go since I'm here. And then. um and then went to Spain afterwards and spent some time in Barcelona. I'm like, ah, this is my happy place. Oh, dude. I mean, like, uh, I actually going to have a kid that's uh, the USA kid that's going to be in the Red Bull Rookies Cup um, on the show. Like oh, Christian, Christian Daniels. Yeah. Yeah. We talked uh, about you know, yeah. So Christian um, and his dad moved there, I don't know, five, six years ago. And you know, the kid was like eight. And now he's like, you know, not eight anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he's duty Red Bull rookie, man. Yeah, and, uh, really cool. Yeah, and they're, I don't know if they want to come back. I mean, they're stoked to be there. And, you know, there's a few little things there, but I mean, the cycling there looks amazing. Yeah. And, um, you know, the food was like, mm, but everything was cheap. So it was like, oh, I love mm. the food. I love the food in, in Barcelona. You like, you like tapas? I like tapas. I like cheese. I like meat. I like finger food. Like, I mean, like the eating for me in Spain is just like, it never ends. I would, I would probably weigh a thousand pounds if I lived in Spain. Oh, well, if I, if we lived in Sevilla, that's a different, like Sevilla was a different thing than Barcelona to me. Oh yeah. No, very different. Yeah. yeah. So like we, we had a, we had a, some pretty epic stuff there and Port of Mal was crazy too. Like, you know, rent a car. Drive. It was like driving to, like driving to Chuck Walla. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was surprised. Like <laughs> driving, I rented a car in Lisbon and drove down, and I stayed in Lagos. Yeah. <clears throat> and I was surprised that the drive across the countryside is just like, I'm like, I could be in Wisconsin right now, bro. We like, um, we we took the highway to get to get to get to town, but on the way out, 
we ended up on some back road and it was like dude it was like 75 miles of like angeles crest it was mm -hmm. awesome it was awesome oh man i wish i would have done that i didn't have the time to actually spend that on the way there and back yeah. i was like kind of rushing but i wish i would have. i saw some of those roads along the coast in those small oh, towns dude. with like random portuguese castles yeah Just dude <clears throat> yeah that and then like you know it's like farmland little tiny town with like a convenience store kind of and like a like a roll in roll out gas station there was no there was no rolling in backwards or not it's like one way yeah you roll in and get the fuck out and it's great and if you go the wrong way out you'll have some portuguese dude in a little shit box like shaking his fist at you and oh, yeah. yelling at you in portuguese which is amazing <laughs> you're like i'm experiencing europe <laughs> yeah dude um we actually um on the way to the on the way um we were at the track and i ended up having to run a bunch of errands um yeah like somehow uh one of the bikes didn't have the correct graphics or did they forgot them on the bench at the shop oh wow and so like we're in port and richard's like you gotta you gotta figure it out man here here's the phone book man fucking <laughs> yeah go print them and, out find a king yeah case. dude and so like in in port of Mau, like they're in town like literally like what 20 with 20 minutes outside of the racetrack mm -hmm. in town there was a sticker dude that's like a big fan of superbike and knew we were there knew like was a fan of of the team and was like stop what he was doing and did it for us that's amazing so, but on the way there we did see like a goat herder so that was kind of neat yeah excellent yeah because it's like a little it's like a little horse trail to get there from town right that yeah, narrow ass it, road it's i think that they've done some work on it it's it's quite a bit better i i said i think in one of my last videos like getting in there was great going up to the circuit yeah. getting out of there on race day i think i was sat in front of the circuit for three and a half hours because yeah it's that like one small road in yeah. and out there and once you're yeah. in i like i sat in the park parking lot and was just like um i'm gonna yeah. get my donuts in my car yeah, when we were there, it was World Superbike, and it was the year before, it was like twenty twenty two, I think, and yeah. um, there was like nobody there. You know, oh, really? Like, oh, yeah. I mean, there was some fans there, but it wasn't like it's it wasn't grown like, a lot there. It feels like it was not like what you saw on TV from MotoGP last weekend. No, right? I, even last, even when I went, it didn't feel that full. Yeah, it felt like the grandstand only really filled up for the GP race. Like on on Friday, it was a ghost town. On Saturday, it yeah. was pretty much a ghost town. And Sunday, it was pretty full, um, but obviously everyone's leaving at the same time. But this year, the, the pictures looked a lot different. Yeah, the the track looks amazing. I mean, that's it's like one of my bucket list tracks. I mean, the place looks like a freaking roller coaster, but it also looks super fast. I mean, I know yeah. that the super bikes are like 200 mile an hour down the straightaway or like, you know, upper 190s, probably 200. I don't know how fast the GP bikes are going, but they're they're going so fast because that last corner is just all speed. There's it's not a stop start track, so that yeah. last corner they're carrying so much speed yeah. on that last bend that they're hitting the they're hitting the straightaway at 180. Yeah, and I don't know about that, but they're I mean, ripping. I mean, they are absolutely ripping. Yeah, it is is right. It, I sat at that last corner just because I wanted to see what what the speed was around that last bend, and I was I was like. A little blown away yeah yeah because i i i feel like i've the where i'd been to races you know coda you know all the straightaways are kind of come off like a hairpin or a 90. so like yeah. they're not getting up to top speed until just before they're hitting the brakes yeah whereas it feels like portamao they're topping off that bike halfway down the straight yeah. and then they come yeah. down that crest and you're like it's just a down ear a down it is a roller coaster dude on the on the first lap of the super bike one of the super bike races i literally stuck my phone out the fence like on pit lane and it was like i mean <laughs> yeah it's like it's like high five but no <laughs> yeah they just grab the phone on the way by and take dude, a selfie for yeah dude yeah, yeah. it's so gnarly i mean like when you're that close and they're ripping by it like 200 mile an hour i mean it's you know like uh jacob garcia right here on, in the comments is saying that they're the super bikes are like 205 so yeah. i'm wondering um i'm wondering how quick the gp bikes are probably more yeah i didn't pay attention to the speed traps i don't think i saw the, the times this year yeah. of what, what they were on that on the, the straightaway but it's it's but, fast. but what's gnarly is at the end of the straightaway it kind of does this number yeah and then and then they gotta go down to like first gear yeah, it's the opposite of Coda where you climb the hill into turn one. They're dropping yeah. off the cliff. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 
So I could see uh, where the writer's depth perception on the way into that. I mean, you really got to be switched on, man. Like, well, too, they're also saying because it drops away so fast, if you hit the brakes too soon, you can lock the front so easy because the yeah. ground goes away from you. But if oh, you yeah. break too late, you're into the gravel. Yeah. So yeah. you have to be like really that, that happy medium, you know, yeah. that happy medium. And it's like those guys, there is no such thing as a happy medium with those guys. Right. Not really. Yeah. Not really. Yeah. It's pretty, so, pretty extreme push, push. Right. So what's your deal? Like your podcast is like very MotoGP centric. So what, what created this um, love affair that you have or obsession, if you will, with MotoGP? So it's a little weird. Like I did not grow up around motorbikes and motorsports. Like I was always NFL, NBA. Like that was my thing. Like I wanted a mini bike when I was a kid. And I think I said before, like my mom was like, no, you're not having one. <laughs> so I was never really into motorsports and it was a handful of years ago and i sat down and i think it was on amazon i clicked on one of those mike mark neal documentaries oh and yeah I, and Good i think dude. Was, i think it was hitting the apex is the one that i watched first okay like yeah the, the last one i ended up seeing first and i'd seen moto gp i mean i i did have a poster of kevin schwantz like that i'd ripped out of a magazine like on my wall when i was a kid because i just thought the bike was cool yeah um and so I watched Hitting the Apex and I was like, man, like the storytelling, the characters and like, you know, Marco Simoncelli passes away, like in the filming. of It's just Dude. like I was blown away by the sport, the characters, the speed, all of it. And so there, you you didn't know about uh, Simoncelli until the watching the. Oh, really? OK. Yeah, I, I like like the whole motor motorcycle world was outside of my area of attention it was it was always football i have a huge football fan it was always that stuff and never yeah. really motorsport so i went into that documentary knowing really not very much i knew who rossi was right. i knew who aiden was but i didn't really know much more than that and so i'm watching this documentary kind of as an idiot and i'm going awesome. like and so then I went back and watched Faster and Fastest and The Doctor and The yeah. Kentucky Kid and The Texas Tornado and all that. And and I would go on YouTube and watch the YouTube highlights of like the recent races. And I was kind of just like, well, you can't watch it, it in America. You in. It sucked you in, right? It like, really did suck me in. And so about six years ago, I decided maybe it was maybe I would say I'll just going to say six years ago. I don't know if it's true. Um, I was like, you know, what? I'm just going to go all in. I'm going to like get the MotoGP subscription. I'm going to go back. And I started watching races from like 2000. And I watched every race in the MotoGP archive from 2000 forward. Oh, wow. Like, every night I would watch. You, like, binge, you binged watched MotoGP. I binged watched the history of the sport. That's awesome. And it was it was really cool because you got to see like obviously 2000 was Kenny Roberts Jr. winning the MotoGP yeah. title. Yeah. And it's also the introduction of Rossi to MotoGP right and his reign and then you know the Casey Stoner rivalry and the yeah and Aiden winning it's like it's like you really got to see well, the, the story the Max from, Biaggi rivalry first right yeah well yeah so Max oh. Biaggi yeah you know? old school old yeah. school um and then you know Casey and Danny and Marco Simoncelli and the kind of creation of like Rossi like wanting to bring the Italians in so almost the creation of VR46 yeah and, and just that evolution of everything, it was, it was actually kind of fun to watch it all knowing where it was going because you, I could really appreciate it because, like, you know, obviously from from knowing like who Mark Marquez is and where the sport had gone, watching yeah. the from, you know, his rookie year, knowing that it was just like it all put everything into context of like, oh, yeah. he really came in. It's like yeah. Danny Pedrosa is like, OK, it's my turn. Right. And Mark is right. like, no, you don't get a right. turn. Yeah, you don't get a turn. He was like the the perpetual second place dude like yeah. basically his whole career yeah and i think the only season that he really like he was going to win the title was the season he got hurt and it was sim and shelly who'd run him off the track and right. injured him. and that was kind of the season that it was like this is danny's turn and it would kind of got blown up um but do you yeah, remember that... do you remember or, or did you did you see how the the fans kind of turned on Danny um, in 2006 when he wiped out Nikki with a couple rounds to go. I I, I remember that vaguely, Dude. and Nikki Hayden to me is such an interesting um person in the sport because obviously he's the American that's come into the European yeah. championship. He comes from Superbike, 
And I, I see it so many either ways, either people hold him up on this pedestal of like the greatest thing that's ever right. ridden a motorcycle, or he's the worst champion ever to win because of oh, how many races did he win that year? No, the only one because Rossi oh, wiped out. So like it's everybody that or, says or, that or, is or, everybody that says that kind of trash is um, oh, such a gar- moron. A moron. It's such garbage. Yeah. Like the dude won a world championship at the highest level. You're going to talk shit about his writing. Like you're a moron. <laughs> yeah, and that's what I, 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 it gets, it gets me, like, and I get it, like, I don't really hold Nicky Hayden up as the greatest motorcycle racer in history, right. but you have to appreciate what he did and what he went through to get there and how difficult. I mean, they said, they said the same shit about KRJR, too, um, and he won the world title on a fucking Suzuki. Yeah, yeah. Right? And, like, and then the team quits on him, <clears throat> so you're like, yeah. how much were they even invested in winning that world title? Because the, the company knew where they were going. Oh, yeah, like 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 the team didn't, but the company knew where they were going. So you're not getting the full like, yes, okay, yeah. he won one race that season. Yeah, he won one race. Do you know how many people total have ever won a MotoGP yeah. race? It's not that Dude, many. How many people are on the grid right now that haven't won a race? A you lot. probably know this stat. I don't like, know the exact stat, but I can. What? But I can yeah, start now it. you're gonna have to file it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Well, I mean, look 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 at Johan Zarco last yeah. year. I mean, it was his 200th race or something, and it was yeah. his first win. And you're like, yeah, and the, and if you want to call that guy a slouch, I think you're a little insane. Yeah. Because that guy's been fast on independent teams his whole career. Yeah. Yeah. He had a meltdown at KTM. That was not the best years for old old Mr. Zarco. Yeah. But like he no one was making the Sponsorama racing team visible on the grid until Johan Zarco went over there. Yeah. Are you following the other uh you're following Moto two and Moto Three as well or? I, so I, I follow Moto2 and Moto3 personally. I watch, so I, the, the way I kind of watch a MotoGP weekend, and I, I kind of go through this with on my channel sometimes, is I watch the MotoGP practice on Friday, obviously the both practices. I watch qualifying and the sprint on Saturday. And then on Sunday, I watch all three categories. I don't usually pay attention to the practices in Moto3, Moto2. I, yeah. just don't, I don't have 10 hours. I have like five a week, a weekend. Right. And... I love Moto3. Moto3 to me is the most entertaining category maybe in motorcycle racing. Um, they're riding lawnmowers. They're all the the equal lawnmower and they're young and hungry and bold and it's pretty damn entertaining. Yeah. Um, well, I'm doing this show uh, with Ricky Bobby called The Weekend Hangover and um, man, both of us, I mean, this year, it's like I can't seem to get into Moto three this year. I don't know. Like every year it seems to be like there's some there's somebody that's shining and you're like wanna give a shit about it. And this year I'm just like not feeling it, dude. Like maybe, maybe as the season progresses, will somebody will break out and they'll be like the man for a second. But like I don't know. And Moto Two, dude, I didn't even watch Moto Two yet. I'll be honest. I haven't watched oh, it. Oh, but I know cool. Joe Two Joe Roberts, year, right? right? Yeah, Joe Roberts, right? Like I think he podiumed. Right. Yeah, he got second in the last yeah. race. Both yeah, moto- so-, so the first Moto Two race was bizarre. It's a new tire era in Moto. Yeah, Pirelli. Pirelli. No yes. one knew what to expect. Yeah, and well, you saw some of the best riders. Pirelli um, on the suit right there. Yeah. There you go. See, yeah. um, none of the riders knew what to expect, and so I mean, you had like some of the best riders burning up their tire within five laps and just falling back. Well, they've done you some just- testing, right? They they did they- testing. So they did. Right? They did. They did like one test at Portimao. And then they went to Qatar, and I think their first test was basically scrubbed off because the t- the track was so dirty, and and it rained. Yeah. So they didn't get really any. They got literally one practice session before qualifying <laughs> to, to try to figure it out, and a lot of the teams didn't figure it out, and some of the teams did. But like Fermin Aldeguer, who was moving to MotoGP, who's supposed to be like the the Im- impenetrable wonder boy in, in Moto2, was nowhere in the first race. And it was really like he started poor, he qualified poorly, he started poorly, and I think he was outside the points. And then you yes. had people like Joe Roberts and even his teammate, now I'm blanking on his name, um, kind of figuring out a little better and running. I mean, I think Joe Roberts, he qualified 14th, he finished 7th. Yeah. So he moved forward the whole race as people like Aaron Connett and everyone else just fallen off. Yeah, then, Joe, Joe's been doing a lot of track days and shit out here in the off season on his R1 on Pirelli's. I believe I believe he's like a SoCal like Pirelli mm-hmm. dude now. Like he's like the 
I don't know. I, I hate to use the word influencer, but yeah. Yeah. Well, we call it spokesperson. Yeah. He's the, he's, uh, he's getting the Pirelli bro deal. Uh, yeah. You know. I'm yeah. for sure. I'm for sure. He is. I mean, listen for Joe Roberts. Now is the time. Yeah. He will never have an opportunity like this because I, I've said it like a half a dozen times. I'm like, this guy track house racing is begging Joe Roberts to have a massive year. Like they're Dude. like, listen, man, any excuse we can put an American on the track house bike next season, any dude, excuse. Absolutely. We want Cash you up in here. on that shit, dude. <laughs> yeah. So he, he knows. And, and he was at the track house launch here in LA. Um, I think so was, so was Hopper. Like they were, they were here. They have a relationship. Yeah. And, and I know like, like those two, they're like, please let us get married. Please just put in the form in Moto2 that we don't get raked over the coals for bringing you. Cause even if he comes up to Moto GP and he's not successful right away, Having yes. an American on the American bike is like the priority is is here, dude. Joe's been at it for a long time, man. Like, yeah, he's still pretty young, but dude, I can remember when he was a little guy coming out and he was like all helmet and he was like um, racing. Uh, I guess you could say he was racing a stock like uh, super bike school BMW. Okay, yeah, and he was ripping back then. That was like that was like ten years ago. Yeah. So, He's been, you know, the, he's been kind of like the lone American. I know Cam Bobier went over to Moto2 for a couple of years and yeah. did this thing. And now he's back at in, in Moto America. But he was just, he's kind of like the American waving the flag over there for forever. Yeah. yeah he's, and you know what? Good on it, man. Like, I think, I think Joe's done a great job. You know, like he's, uh, he, he's been on some teams that were a little sus. You know, that I, I suspect that the team that Cam Bobier was on was a little sus as well. Yeah, they, I mean, they were so American racing team didn't get I don't think they had really the resources behind either one of them. No, no, at, no. At, especially at the time. I think they're getting a little more funding. I think they're putting a little yeah. more into it because last year I feel like the bike was actually a lot better than it had been in quite some time. Right. Camp showed some flashes of brilliance. In oh, 100 percent. Um, in spite of the. In, in, and I think Joe did, too. I think Joe, when he was with the American racing team, like I would I would I would love to know the intricacies of Joe's move over to Italtrans, the Italian team, because that team yeah. won a title with Anea Bastianini. Joe right. goes over there and takes that seat and they had a lot of high hopes for him, but it never really seemed to work and they never got the bike working. He never got it really together there. He had that one race win that was that weird rain race yes. in Portimao. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it, 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 I would love to know like what the intricacies of that, because his form, Felt that was like it fall off a you know it fell off a cliff and now he's yeah. back in moto you know American Moto Racing um, Team America fuck yeah he's there for two races and he's you know second in the world championship so right like wait the rider yeah. was, what was going like, on over shit there. they got some funding yeah that's what that means right yeah well I mean like, I'm, it's I'm, unfortunate I'm, as fans like we don't as fans of the sport we don't really get much of an inside look over there you know what I mean like yeah. You know, and, and, and I think nobody that's... knows the nobody knows beyond the um, superficial marketing bullshit answers. Yeah. And it's fun. So I was in Moto America. That's it's actually this reminds me. I was in Moto America last year for I mean, uh, in Laguna Seca for Moto America last year. And I was just walking around the paddock and, you know, just kind of walking through the tents and stuff. And the stuff you pick up just by walking around um, is so much more than we ever hear from any of the media commentating. Like when you, when you observe the sport from far away, even the best, like other sports, I think we underappreciate how much access the media has to yeah. all these sports that we just yeah. don't have in motorcycle racing because the funding and the popularity for the sport isn't there, but it is a little bit of chicken or the egg. Like you need to grant the access in order to gain yeah. interest. Yeah. That's the thing. I think American fans with MotoGP, they're, you know, they're the American fans are used to going to Moto America and you can go right up to the riders. You can go right up to their, you know, you at Laguna, you spend whatever you spend for the pit pass or whatever, and you can go right into their pit and whatever. And Moto GP, their shit's like on lockdown. Like you, yeah, I don't know. You got to have like the super duper cool guy pass or whatever to, to get close there. Right. Absolutely. I mean, I went the first year I went to Circuit of the Americas. I just got, I sat in the grandstand and, you know, I'd never been to a MotoGP event because I hadn't been to Coda yet. And we we're coming off when, of COVID. When was that? That was the first year they were back after, oh, COVID. after COVID. So, okay. so 2021. Yeah. yeah 2021. I, went, I went in 2019. 
Yeah. So I was going to go yeah. in 2020 and then that obviously fell apart. And so the first year I went, you know, just grandstand experience the, the race had a great time. The grounds, I think Coda's is a great track to go to the fact you can walk around the whole thing and watch from every single corner. Oh yeah. And yeah. like, I always tell people it's like, a hike. It, it's a hike. It's, you oh, do, yeah. It's it's, it took me like two days. Like the first day I walked one direction from my seats and yeah. like watched. And then, this, but I always tell people on Friday, the, the people who are like the, the people who work there don't give a shit where you sit. They're not checking tickets. They don't care. Like you go wherever you want with the exception of maybe the paddock and like the VIP area. So you can sit in any grandstand you want on Friday and Saturday and just watch yeah. from where and then Sunday they, yeah. they kind of care more. Um, but on the next year I went in 2022, I went full like moto VIP village. Um, they weren't doing paddock passes cause they were still under a little bit of COVID restrictions. So they weren't doing paddock passes at all, but I found like, I found this crazy deal on a, VIP village ticket. And so I was like, let me see what this is like. And even that you get like a very structured pit lane walk where oh, okay. we're like four of the riders. Yeah. Are yeah I remember there. that. Yeah. Yeah. Jack okay. Miller was out there signing autographs and, and Hopkins and uh, Sean Dillon Kelly and like some of the moto two guys, the most fun I had. So here's the hot tip. If you're going to Austin and you want to meet riders and you want to like mix it up with the teams, you have to go out on Sunday night after the race. You have to go out on Congress or you have to go out on 6th Street because the riders and the teams are out there getting shit faced and listening to music wow. because there's free music. All There's no covers at any of the bars on Congress on Sunday. So you can get like in. How to, go to mo how to get the most out of MotoGP experience I'm by telling the horsepower you. rodeo dude. And so as an American, you can spot the Europeans from a bajillion miles away. Yeah, like, dude. From three blocks away, you go, oh, there's a group of Europeans. That must be a race team. And I walk up the block, and sure enough, Ayagura and some Ket Chantra from the team, the Asia team racing in Moto2 are just chilling. And yeah. I went to the bar with them and just had drinks and drank with the, the engineers and the crew and, like, everyone was just cheersing. I got some stupid videos of me being like... <laughs> And, and uh, I can't remember the, the engineer, the, the team engineer for Honda Team Asia was just like, this guy, he's the man, he's the man. And I'm like, we just met, bro. Like, you're, you're going to start going around telling, like, the uh, Burt Kreischer, the machine story. <laughs> exactly, exactly. This is how I became a MotoGP rider. Yeah. Uh, and then I went to the next, and I was just literally, I was going into bars, seeing if there was any riders and teams, because yeah. there's no covers. And then I would just walk out and go to the next bar. And then I ended up at a bar with Simon Crayfar. And wow. I like picking his brain for like half an hour and he was just like happy to talk about motorbikes and just like be a dork. And it was, it was fantastic. So like, if you're going to Coda, I'm telling you, no one's out Friday and Saturday, except for like brunch. I ran into a couple teams at brunch, um, Thursday and Friday morning, but on Sunday night, all the teams are out, the race is over, the pressure's off and they're out having a good time and they're That's all awesome. over the place. That's awesome. That sounds like, uh, it sounds like the old Friday nights in Monterey, uh, with Anthony Gobert. <laughs> Or Saturday night, or Sunday night, or <laughs> oh, every night. They used to party a lot more, I think, in the old. Oh days. yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, when I was there in 2019, we, um, you know, with the Mythos crew, um, Bruno, the the guy that founded Mythos, was like best buddies with Cito Pons. So we ended up at some fucking barbecue joint with Cito Pons, his whole team, his crew, writers, everything, and it was us, the Mythos crew the attack yamaha crew and then the Cito ponds crew so like we're just out there eating barbecue and they're like oh this is what barbecue's like okay cool <laughs> yeah it's kind of wild yeah my favorite the, i haven't told the story completely because i don't know how much like i want to out um aaron Kennett and Furman aldeguer but yeah. it was, this seems like the, the right the right it's not yeah, even, it's not nobody even gives that. a shit like but it, it really it really <laughs> cracked me up because we're sitting at i was sitting in this mexican restaurant that was packed and I think I got the last table in the whole place. And I'm sitting there eating and I look at the bar and Aaron Kinnett is pretty identifiable. Let's just say. Uh, neck tattoos and all. Just neck tattoos. Yeah, dude. It was like, you could spot that guy from a long way away. And I, and, yeah. the kid, and there was a dude with him at the bar. And I'm like, this guy looks like he's 12. <laughs> and they're both sitting at the bar and they didn't have a table for them. <laughs> and then the bartender wouldn't serve them. And then I, I like got on my Google machine right there and I was like, Oh, Furman's 16. No wonder yeah. they're not serving him at this bar. And they were both just kind of like, well, what are we going to do now, dog? Yeah. And like, you could tell like Aaron's like, like uh, demeanor was very much like, this is what you get for being young. <laughs> like, why am I hanging yeah. out with the young kid who can't drink? This sucks. But they they go, he's like going to a high school party. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was just like, oh, this sucks. This sucks. I thought this was going to be much easier. 
because like in Europe, you can drink when you're 18. I think a lot of them don't even realize you get to Texas and you're then they're like 21. And so if you're used to drinking and partying it up when you're 18, 17. I mean, I'm from Wisconsin. Right. You can drink as long as your parents are in the bar with you. Right. Um, but it, I was I was laughing, at them, but they were really cool. They came over and, and, and hung out and said hi and stuff. But I was like, dude, you're 16. They're not going to serve you in this bar. <laughs> and now wow. he's Mr. MotoGP newcomer. So, yeah, well, I mean, you know, what are you going to do? Right. Yeah. Good for him, man. He had, yeah. Like, like, like he deserved it. He had a hell of an end of the last season. So, he yeah, I, I, I like to walk around. This, maybe I'm just weird like that, but I like to walk around and hunt down uh, famous comedians and stuff that show up to those races. Oh, so, wow. Like, I, yeah. I, so like when I was there, I, I ran into uh, BT and um, Alonzo Bowden. Oh, yeah. And, I did a ride um, with him. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, man, you're walking around. And it's like, man, these are like, they're just walking around. Nobody, I was like, hey. So yeah, they're the realest you know, people. Oh, totally. Totally. They're, and they're super into it, man. Like BT does this, like, he does these, like, one minute previews or whatever on YouTube mm -hmm. of the next MotoGP race. It's pretty, pretty funny. I'll have to check those um, out. Yeah. He's, uh, and, and I recognize him because, uh, one of my, one of my track days dudes, um, Lyle Jeffrey Brown is a stand up comic. And for a couple years, when MotoGP was still at Laguna Seca, dude, he would set up these nights of uh, comedy on like Friday night during the GP weekend, and it was BT was one of the acts that uh, LGB set up. So um, yeah, he was hilarious. The dude was hilarious. So um, yeah, I don't know. It's weird, but yeah, fun though. Yeah, we tried to when we were a super bike last year. Um, with uh moto america i tried to go to joe's uh joe rogan's comedy thing and it was like sold out oh yeah yeah <laughs> like i didn't do any planning there i was just like oh look let's go to joe's and uh i was i was trying to shout out bill burr for like the first like like six months i was doing um moto gp stuff on tiktok because and i'm he's on tiktok he's on twitter but not on on tiktok or x he's on x um yeah, right uh whatever um but because he became a huge moto gp fan yeah out of nowhere and uh and his his explanation i think i've posted a few times of like why he was was became a moto gp fan is like to me is the best because he's like listen i was watching a sport it was boring and i was sick of it so i decided to watch <laughs> moto gp yeah and it's the same sport it's just so much freaking better and he was yeah. talking about, he was talking about formula one but you know oh uh, well I mean, look, you know, I was about to say, like, you, you were all about football or ball sports or whatever, and you just switch from liking one sport that ha that's uh, all about one ball and switch to a sport that takes two. For sure. I mean, For know. sure. Very, it's very similar but different. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. It's, right on. It, I didn't expect, I, I think when I first started paying attention to MotoGP, I was like, oh, this is kind of a fun thing to pay attention to. And then I, as I learned more about it and learned about how the teams work and like, I mean, really educating myself on it. Like, I just got so interested in all the, the nerd shit and not just like, oh, the, oh yeah, bikes are fast. Bikes are fast. But like the tech and the arrow and the, the kind of like the way the regulations work and change and how we're going into, you know, 2027, they're going to a completely different set of, of rules. And I was like, yeah, Man, this sport is just so different because like, I think we're used to in America sports that are more or less haven't changed in 50, 60 years. Like there are, there are right. tweaks to the rules, but you know, like the kickoff rule in NFL this year, they're, they're going bananas over because it's a pretty drastic change. Our sports don't hmm. change that much. And yeah, so, I don't, I don't know. I, I, haven't, I haven't paid attention to ball sports in 20 years. <laughs> yeah. It comes across my, it comes across my feeds. And so that's about as much mm. I see a lot. I see a lot of headlines in ball sports, I think. And then I pay attention now on the MotoGP side. Yeah, I, I, I just know that's how they're over. <laughs> yeah. When I, when I start seeing headlines, I know it's about to be over. And I'm like, sweet. So. <laughs> it's playoffs, right? Is it playoffs yet? Oh, wow. Oh. I get my friends shit. Uh, like, <laughs> like we'll, we'll, we'll go out and I'll be like, is baseball season still going on? Like, still? Dude, that season is like, you know how I know baseball is on my TV? I've said this a lot. I, you know, uh, Gil Ramos uh, is one of my staff guys. Like, he laughs and almost cries when I say this. But it's like, dude, I know that baseball's on the TV in my house. You know why? Because I'm fucking bored. 
like that is baseball and golf are like the most boring fucking sports to watch ever i, oh I can't I, I can't get into it dude i it's like i don't i don't get it yeah i, yeah. I can't i i think televised they're 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 painful they're very oh, and dude. honestly i i would put football and basketball in there too like oh like, dude like I, I'm, I want to do a, a series on my channel, which is called um, "Your Sport Is Boring." Yeah, because, dude. Because and, and, <laughs> and like the the thesis of the the thesis of the series is that all sports are boring if you don't really know much about them. Right. But also, your sport is boring. Um, because yeah. people always thought, oh, motorcycle racing is so boring. They just ride around in a circle. I'm like, yeah, if you know nothing about it. Right. I totally get how you watch a race and there's one guy who's leading. And the cameras are just, and the commentators are just blabbing about facts and figures that you know nothing about. Right. And I, I, I understand how you kind of lose your attention of that. Yeah. But it's the same thing. I, I when I was training martial arts, like when you watch jujitsu, it's incredibly boring to watch two black belt jujitsu guys go at each other because every they're like two dudes rolling around, two sweaty dudes rolling around on the ground. That's they barely, <laughs> they barely roll. They barely move. It looks, it li <laughs> literally looks like two guys laying on the ground hugging each other. Yes until the match is over and so you yeah. can't appreciate it unless you really appreciate the intricacies like you have to really love brazilian jiu-jitsu to think it's cool because right. it's boring as fuck to watch as a person who knows nothing about it yeah i mean i i mean i'm, I'm not really into mma stuff either like i i can't i, I just can't do it i i, I used to be i try I to, to get into it i try to get into it i just I, I want to get into it. It seems like something I'd be into. And then I'm like, I see two sweaty dudes rolling around in their underwear. And I'm like, nah, dude, I'm good. Yeah. I, I <laughs> one of my first, one of my first jobs in the entertainment industry, I worked on a reality show called the ultimate fighter. It's a spike okay. TV show. They put a bunch of react, they put a bunch of uh, UFC fighters in a house and they fight. I for kind a of, I kind of remember that. Yeah. I, of, I, I don't think I watched it, but I, I think they still do it. it. They might still, oh. do, it. I think they still do it. Um, and so I got to spend a lot of time with some of those fighters and like learn a little more of the intricacy. So I was like kind of into it for a quick minute, but it wasn't sustainable for me. It's like, yeah. and, and, and especially the kind of like toxic bro culture that like, just <laughs> the, the people who watch it are just so like chest bumpy. And like, we, we went out, I went out to, for, for drinks with, it was me and like four of the fighters and a couple of the other guys I worked with. And they were so into UFC they were almost picking fights with people in the bar on behalf of the fighters. Oh my God. They're like, oh, I bet this guy could kick your ass. And I'm like, dude, like the, the fighters aren't even like this. Why are the fans like this? Um, so I, I, I step back from the whole thing. It's actually wow. weirdly part of the reason I like motorcycle racing is yes, there are rivalries and yes, you can have riders that you may prefer. There's not a lot of villains, like straight up villains. Yeah, not anymore. Everything is like, I don't know. I, I mean, I kind of long for the old era where like, you know, I'm I'm sure because you've studied up on the history of shit forever to the way back. I don't know how far back, but you've heard of those old legends about how, you know, Kenny Roberts would like roll out of his motorhome and like take shots at the Michelin man. Like, yeah, well, they were nuts back then. And they also like, you know, it's come you know, corporate, I think, you know, there's yeah, so money. There's so much anytime you put a ton of money into a sport the players have to get better to justify that paycheck. Like, right. like Mark Marquez and Fabio Cotterraro are not drinking six nights a week and, and then shooting guns for four other nights a week. They're training, they have dietitians, they've got mental coaches. They've like, it's right. so business now. Oh dude. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, look, I mean, even here, <clears throat> even here in the States, you know, we've got that Ethan dude. And I mean, I've, I've taken lots of pictures and video of him setting up the little, the little colored dots and the little program that the writers have to go through, you know, Chavi was doing the, the red, you know, it was like C and C basically, but yeah, like yeah, yeah, really yeah. fast. And Simon, it's like, man, that, there's Simon thing. Do, 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 do. yeah, yeah. Simon said, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But it's like on a bigger scale and you gotta, you know, and he's like, Oh, see, this is your score. And it's like, wow, bro. Like I, I kind of wanted to try it, but then, you know, we kind of broke early. So, <laughs> So we ended up backing up to leave, but, but, yeah. um, yeah, I mean, there's writers doing that. And you just see that, um, on that formula one Netflix show, right? Like they used to have that Ricardo dude doing that on his wall. Yeah. They all, they all have it like in their trailers or in their yeah. 
stage is just reaction time. Like they drop the tennis ball is the one they like to show all the time. It's yeah. Like dropping the tennis ball and t testing their like, you know, reflexes and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. High and you know. uh, eye hand coordination, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's yeah. all sign now. So yeah. It's much more serious, which I think does lead to like less like wild, wild west feeling. Like I feel like, yeah. You feel like, you know, if you oh, were, it used, if to you were like, a cowboy, used to be like man's man, dude yeah. sitting there on the grid smoking a Marlboro, not, you know, yeah. like a Paul Mall non filter, flicks it aside, puts his helmet on, goes racing. Like that's, yeah. you know, now, and then after the race, they would sit there and drink a 12 pack of Diet Coors. And, you know, I mean, it's just, um, it's not, uh, these guys are like top level athletes now. I mean, oh, and sure. have been for several years. Yeah. And, I um, it feels to me that like the Rossi era, and I'm talking about the Rossi era where he was dominant, was kind of the last era of MotoGP, at least, where they still like partied a lot more than they worked out. Like those guys had fun. I don't know, man. They've I been, think they did. Like I've seen some of the top stuff. level cycle. Yeah. I mean, I, I've heard the Hopper was like a Hopper was like the last of the. Uh, yeah. That, that era. Yeah. That yeah. Era. Those, yeah. That time where it's like you still the fun was a priority it wasn't always like no i gotta get to bed early because i have training tomorrow like if you needed to cycle in the morning you cycle from <laughs> over right like that's right. what you and so but now it feels like yeah the hoppers hayden have you, have you ever cycled hug over yeah one i so i used to do this ride between manhattan beach and la and it wasn't okay. hungover, over but you would you would you would start marina del rey and you would ride i think it's, i think it's about 18 miles or something down the coast to this little bar <laughs> and then you drink and have lunch and on the way back you were full and drunk and yeah and trying okay. to get back to your car and sober up by the time you got to your car so it wasn't hungover cycling but it was um the, the way back wasn't as fun yeah i mean i've i've done a few stupid things like that over the years i don't drink anymore but when i did um uh actually both of these times were with my friend chili so i'm like i don't know i don't know who's a bad influence on who probably me on him or i don't probably know both. It probably i think it's both i think it's mostly him <laughs> um we um we rode we rode from my house down bouquet canyon um and we're having mimosas with my friends from ventura that cycled from ventura there so we're like in santa clarita at a mimi's cafe having mimosas in the morning and then got back on our bicycles and rode home and riding up bouquet canyon with a couple three mimosas in you not the best idea yeah i can't imagine <laughs> that works out real well for anybody involved <laughs> and then we Including did one the where cars behind you just honk no the no there, uh, thankfully there wasn't any really but yeah. um the other one was we went from santa monica down to pv and um i think we were at the acapulco restaurant drinking margaritas oh yeah that's another and then we one. had to ride back kind of fucked up and it started raining on us too <laughs> So that's extra that's extra it's like a country song right yeah so uh um, your, girl, your girlfriend broke up with you you had to ride yeah her. yeah the yeah the, the the newspaper dude kicked my dog and you yeah. know my pickup got stolen yeah totally nice so so uh do you do you pay attention to the other sports uh, in our motorbike racing world you um dabble in world superbike stuff motor so america I, superbike what i pay attention deal? i try to pay attention um i've I don't watch Superbike week on week, like as far as like tuning into it. I I, I kind of pay attention to like who's competitive and who's winning and and where the, the I just again like it, it becomes down to like a time thing, where it's like, all right, here's how much time I'm I have. Shaking to, my fist at you. No, I know. I, I actually I enjoy the Superbike and I think like the, yeah. the I think it's a, again still a little more Wild West. Like they haven't gone full tech with as far as the arrow goes and the full electronics. Like the bikes are still closer to bikes. Um, I mean, that, they're pretty electronical now. I mean, yeah, they're, they're very, high, they're very high tech, but I, they haven't yeah. gone full MotoGP on them. No, no, no. But it's and, a street uh, bike, dude. Like, yeah, you know, MotoGP is like proto prototype, prototype, you know, yeah. no, no expense spared, you know, within the rules. Right. Yeah. Whereas a uh, super bike, it's a, you know, you, they, the bike starts life as a bike you could buy off the showroom floor. Yeah. So, I think that's, a, and I think that's really, I think that's what's cool about it. Like, right. and I, I, get annoyed at moto gp fans who shit on world superbike because i'm like well yeah. like the i think the cool thing about moto gp is the tech is the fact that you 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 hand someone a rule book and you say build the best motorcycle according to these rules and right. that's it. 
And it's kind of who can figure out the rules the best and the tricks and like, well, is this in the rules? Or is, you know, like it's an engineering game. And then you put world-class athletes on it and they go. Where a super bike, I think is cool because you're like, oh, that bike, you could ride that tomorrow. You go to a showroom down the street, get on an R1. You can't ride that bike. <laughs> no, but but but, but I'm, yeah, like we say, it's like when it starts life as that. Yeah, like it's you. You can see the evolution of it. You can see where street oh, goes to a super bike, and it's that part's really interesting to me. And the same, yeah. like, I, I was really into like rally for a little, quick minute because you're just like, I'm going to take a WRX see, rally. Rally's exciting too. Yeah, rally's super cool, and I've been to some really like small kind of like grassroots events where like literally the cars were on showroom floors and they put a roll cage oh, on them. like you went to a rally event yeah there was there's this weird oh, little badass. there's this weird little rally race in south carolina called the sandblast rally it's in a tiny tiny town on the southern south carolina north carolina border okay and the entire forest is covered in beach sand it's basically like you know this used to be lake bed or something and now they planted it, a bunch of trees in sand yeah, so it's a bunch of trees in the middle of the forest and in the road and everything around is made of sand and they do a rally there and it beats the fucking shit out of the cars. Like it is a race of attrition. It kills wow. so many cars, but it's also a grassroots event. So if you have a car that is rally rated and has a, a race book, you can enter this. You can, it, It's 200 oh, bucks or something. Wow. And so I met a guy there that I'd seen this car. It was like a Eagle Talon. It was online on this rally race thing it's like hey race book included you know three grand buy my old rally car <laughs> i saw that online two weeks later i'm standing at the at the the shakedown for that rally and i see that car is lined up for the no shakedown. way <laughs> and, and, I go up to, and, I, and i go up to the guy and i go did you just buy this or was this your car you were trying to sell he goes well i live in alaska i've always wanted to do a rally this one's really cheap I flew from Alaska to Knoxville, Tennessee. I bought the car. Me and a buddy put it on a trailer. We hauled it to North Carolina, and I'm racing today. That's that's amazing. That's cool. That is the that's coolest just thing ever. Freaking awesome. So that's a roundabout way of saying like I I do like I really appreciate that how different the superbike is and how you know they're what they're doing to these bikes and how they make yeah. them still better year after year. Yeah, um, I yeah. mean I'm trying to you know with my relationship with the attack boys, like I'm trying to showcase the bike and just show people like the inside that you can't really see on TV and they don't really talk about it too much, but it's like, man, if people knew how gnarly those things really were like up close and it's like, man, like that thing's at R1. Yes. But how many, how much of that mo that R1 does is shared with the one sitting behind me, you know? Yeah. Like that's a race bike and that thing is legit. Like my bike is no joke, but it's like not. It's like uh I think I need another hundred grand at least to to be close. And then even then, you know. Yeah. Um it's uh it's pretty cool. And the electronics and all the data stuff now is so crazy. Like, I mean, they get into the ECU and it's just like, oh, you know, like Jake will off the Richard with the track map or Darren Marshall really. And, um, you know, he's got the track map. It's like, I want a little more wheelie control right there. And they're like, okay, cool. And then like how, you know, how they're looking at the squiggly lines. I look at the squiggly lines and I'm like thinking I'm in a colorblindness test. Right. right. I know. And, and everything means. Something. Oh my God. Like I, I have data on this thing and I, I got to the point where it was so much that I just, stop paying attention to most of it and i just paid attention to what i call the whisk gap you know like the the from from brakes to throttle gap mm -hmm. try mm -hmm. to shrink that down you know like yeah. that's that's kind of the extent of what i use the stupid data for but then we looked at some other stuff you know but like yeah. for the most part it was that but like these guys are cool. you know they're fucking around with all kinds of stuff with the electronics well, so. I, was, I try to like explain to people, like when you talk about the highest level of, of any sport, but motorsports in particular, it's that last piece of data that seems minuscule to everyone else. Yeah. But that you paid attention to. That's the difference between winning, losing, being on a podium, yeah. being off a podium. Like you're looking for just fractions of fractions of an improvement 
So right. like if you're going to do a track day, you're not good enough that those fractions are going to mean anything. Like Correct. all the adjustments that these guys are making to a bike on a weekend for most of us who ride motorcycles would make right. no difference in our riding. Absolutely. Yeah. But when you get to the level where you can literally feel when, when the feeling with the bike is that precise and you know that an adjustment like this will help you with the front end just a little bit more, help you break like, just a little bit later. You know, it's so gnarly that, I mean, some of these, those MotoGP dudes, they could feel like, you know, 0.1 bar on the tire pressure. Yeah, because they are literally pushing the limit, yeah. you know, in every corner. And, and that's the other thing I, I try to get across to people of like, you understand that when these guys are pushing, when they're really pushing, they're nearly crashing in every corner. <laughs> like, like, yeah. like every single, not, not even the fast slope, every corner, they are on the edge of crashing i mean you, you watch they the, don't crash most of the time right you watch crazy. the slow-mo right and it's like they're in the corner their knee down they tuck the front you could see the front end fold over and they're just like eh, and it comes yeah. back yeah <laughs> and then they lose unreal. the rear it's unreal <clears throat> and, and, yeah. and and you only get that by really studying it like you only right. get that by riding right. a bajillion laps and understanding what the bike is doing underneath you right and how much data is too much data at some point like i think you can be over like you can yeah. be consumed by data in a bad way also yeah but also like you do have to pick out like what matters what doesn't like you paralysis say paralysis by anal uh, anal what analysis para paralysis by anal anal analysis analysis yeah. of paralysis it's something like that it, it rhymes yeah one of them things yeah i'm the, paralysis I'm just... paralysis by analysis by analysis yeah that's what i said yeah that's what you said <laughs> <laughs> So uh, what, do, what do you think about um, some of the riders kind of criticizing MotoGP? You know, like I think we were talking offline, you know, Casey Stoner and then Ben Spees, you know, it's like, you know, with World Superbike, I actually kind of agree with this too. Like World Superbike is better because it's like, they're still motorbikes, you know, like MotoGP is like spaceships that are super cool spaceships, but like it's, I think the there's a little too many wing, too much wing, like you know, like how many wings is appropriate? Like so, I it's funny because I wasn't bothered by the arrow and the wings until they started putting them on the forks, right? And I was like, we need wings on the forks now, and and now you're seeing some of the um the the smaller teams. I think the Moto three teams are putting these wheel covers with mini yeah. wings on the wheel covers. Yeah. And I'm like, I think the wings should just stay on the fairing. Like, if we're gonna do wings, yeah, it'd be on the fairing. They should be mounted to it. But like, now we're gonna put now we're. What about the transformer shit? Where they, you know, the bike, the bike squats for the start, and then you know, at the corner exit, the thing will squat down, and the bike kind of, it's like a drag race bike down the straightaway, yeah. and then as soon as they roll off, it snaps upright. You know, yeah, the, all the, that transformer shit. It's like, man. Like, and how much of that shit is controlled by the rider? I mean, is it, or is it literally the riders taking a knob? Like, it just seems like a lot of shit for the rider to pay attention to and learn. Well, that's know? the, so that was the argument when they, they kind of banned the front ride height device during the race. They can use the front ride height device at the start of a race, which right. is literally when they, when they come into pit lane or when they come into the grid, you pull the brake hard, the front end goes down, it locks the forks down with, with two pins. It's right. really, really archaic because they're not allowed to lower yeah. electronics. And then when they take off, it keeps those fronts locked in place. And then when they hit the brake and the forks compress, those pins release. And now right. they can ride. And the engineers wanted to make that usable during the race so that they could also squat the front to keep, yeah. the wheelie, to keep the wheelie out. And basically, race direction was like, I think we're giving too much for the riders to do on the bike because they're now they're right. pressing a button for the rear ride height. They're pressing a button for the front ride height. They're pressing yeah. a traction control. They're modulating the throttle. They're controlling a throttle yeah. map, power mapping. Uh, right. They're looking at their dashboard communication from their pit, telling them who's behind them. It's it becomes too much. They're playing. They're playing Tetris on their dash. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I so the, the part of the reason I, I like MotoGP is that it gets a little batshit crazy when it comes to some of this stuff. Like it is, right. you know, you, you have to appreciate like Ducati took their rule, the, the set of rules and they just figured it out better than everyone else. Right. And, but you know what, man, like some of the other manufacturers are coming too. I mean, they the, are. the, the and, KTM and dudes the are like right there, you know, I mean, and it's I like it's a matter of time. Fun. It's a matter of time. I think it's fun to watch the back and forth. You saw Ducati yeah. come out with the, 
with the under the bike scoop a few years back. Right. And everyone was like, what the hell is that? You're not allowed to have downforce underneath the bike. No, no, it's a, it's a tire cooler to keep. Yes. And then every other manufacturer started to do it. And so you see this push pull of, well, you can do it. I can do it. You can do it. Well, we'll do this. You do this. I think that's kind of fun. Right. And as long as it's within like that set of rules, but I do think I, I like it when the rules change because yeah. then it's not just an evolution. Well, it makes them think right. too. It makes them think and regroup, you know, exactly. like what worked before may not work now with the new rules. Exactly. Right? And I think that that makes yeah. everyone better. At, and it also like what technology is that going to bring to bikes that we can buy in the future? Because engineers tried something and right. then now we have some sort of electronics aid for us or some sort of something that helps you to stop the bike quicker in an emergency or i mean look i'm all for the new tech stuff i mean dude if shit never changed we'd still be racing steel frame motorbikes with carburetors right absolutely and so, now there's like an entire generation of riders that have no idea what a carburetor is or have never uh, seen one they got to google it right? have you seen that have you seen that meme that's like like in 1988 your your the manual for your car taught you how to like change the ignition timing yeah and now it tells you not to drink the battery acid yeah it's like yeah. this is how much dumber we've all gotten because right. we used to have like real information at our fingertips and now we don't there's a there's a customer of mine that rolls up sometimes he's got an older um muzzy raptor do you know what that is mm -mm. what's that after after the show you're gonna have to google it oh uh, yeah, uh, yeah yeah it's uh muzzy you know, rob muzzy was the factory kawasaki super bike guy in the 90s okay and he took a zx7 and um you know, that was 750 four cylinder. That was when the super bikes were four cylinders. And he, I think he, he punched out to an 840 gear driven cams and all that with uh flat slide carburetors on it. And, um, you know, flat slide carburetors make this super unique sound. You know, the guy's like, he revs it up and it's like, ting, 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 ting. You know, it's like, uh, yeah. you can hear it, right? It's a super unique sound. And on the back of that bike, because he's riding it like the last couple of years, on the back of it, it says they're called flat slides google it <laughs> that's that's literally a sticker on the back of the he's motorcycle. been asked he's been asked yeah. a few times yeah yeah but i think um, back to your question i do think like you know the comments made by ben spees and casey stoner i i have two minds of it completely yeah. because i mean they're right on, yeah you know i i get it they're right they're right and they're also old men yelling from their lawn get up you know they're like like it's both they're like they're they're cranky old dudes who are like get out my lawn, you young kids but they're also right like two things can be true at the same time right so i i agree with them that i think there are too many aids on the bike probably um it sometimes it's very hard to figure out who the best rider is because of there's just you know so many things that they can adjust to make them right. into a front runner um, do, does all the technology mask who really is the best racer. And, yeah. and my big thing with the arrow is less of like, oh, there's no overtaking. And, you know, like there is, it's all the riders will say it's harder to overtake now in MotoGP than it's ever been because of the hot air and the arrow and the, the front yeah. tire pressure and all that. But they, they do figure it out. Yeah. They were talking um, on, they were talking on the feed this past weekend about how, you know, like over, they were worried that Acosta was going to overheat his front tire and, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, man, wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's another thing for them to think about. And some riders figure it out and some don't. And yeah. so I, to me, it's like, it's hard to say like, oh, the, 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 the arrow era sucks. It's just different. Yeah. And I think when they I didn't say tools, it sucked. No, no, no. But I think that's what kind of Casey is kind right. of like, now these bikes are, you know, the argument of like the bikes don't look like like bikes. It's like, yeah, either do Formula One cars. They're kind of like keeping it in like they're going the Formula One route. Like it or not, that's where they're right. going. Right. And so like Formula One cars don't look like cars either. Yeah. So I um, mean, um, I, I'm curious, like what your thoughts are of when they go to certain tracks, not all tracks, but when they go to super thumb tracks, there's lap times are pretty close with the super bikes. Yeah, it, it's it's funny because the bigger and gnarlier those bikes get, like the harder they are to stop, right? So now, I mean, right. it's the same thing. Again, I'm not a huge track guy, but you see videos of like guys riding around a 600 and a thousand, and the guy in the 600 is doing better lap times because the guy on the thousand yeah. can't corner. Oh, you totally back. need to come to the track, dude. Yeah, I know, I know that. I feel like that's going to be the theme of 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 this coming out. Is like, is yeah, like, track more. But I I think that, yeah, it's it's 
MotoGP is weird because it's not all measured by just one metric of like the lap time or the top speed. Cause like you see some of those tracks, the top speed is just off the chart so much faster than any other thing on the planet. Yeah. And then some tracks, not really. Right. And right. it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a feature of its surroundings, which makes, to me, it makes the bikes a little more unpredictable. It makes the racing different everywhere you go. That's the, I think the hardest thing for American sports fans to wrap their head around is, you know, when you play football or, or, or soccer, it's on the same field every time. Right. But, but motorcycle racing, like the bike rolls out of the garage in Qatar and performs great. And then you go to Portimao and it is a piece of trash and you have to try to <laughs> figure out where, where you went wrong. Right. It's, people don't quite get it. It's like, oh, I, I was talking to people on, on Reddit and, I was, and they're like, well, why, why was he at the front in this race? And he won this race. And why was he only expecting a top 10 at this race? And it's like, because not all tracks are built the same and not all happens. racks are built for them. And shit happens. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, uh, sometimes certain bike characteristics work better at some tracks. Well, you know, there you've heard it, right? Uh, oh, this is a Yamaha track. Oh, Absolutely. this is a Ducati track. I, I don't know if we've heard that in MotoGP in a while with the Yamaha I thing. Think, Sorry. Well, I, I think Love because, that. I mean, we, I think we stopped hearing about it mostly when Suzuki left because I think we had three bikes in the MotoGP grid that were the agile bikes right? versus the raw horsepower bikes. And it right. was always Yamaha, Suzuki, and then Aprilia to a certain extent were the agile bikes. Right. And ATM and Ducati and Honda were the wrestle your face off horsepower bikes and that's the two philosophies right do you want corner speed corner uh entry or do you want raw horsepower and ducati said give us the horsies right um but now that suzuki's gone yamaha is kind of the only bike on the grid that is trying to embrace that corner speed but they're not doing it well enough right they're yeah. they're, they're too far to make a difference so it just feels yeah. like their philosophy is wrong yeah and i Chris think that's very I, I got a comment here. Chris McCreary is saying it's worse when a 13 year old on a 400 Ninja lays down better times than the 600s and thousands. Listen, dude, those 400 people, what, what was, what was the thing I saw the other day? It goes, if you, if you go to the track and there's an old guy and he's running like a 400 and it's a little beat up and it doesn't look like he takes care of it. Don't <laughs> fuck with that dude. He's fast. Yeah. That's uh that dude is uh Steven Ludwig. Just a heads up. Okay. <laughs> I'll look for him out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, like, uh, I think he might be described. I mean, shit, like we've described that, that, that description that Chris fits, uh, Rocco Landers back in the day, mm -hmm. um, Ashton Yates when he was uh, fucking Joe Roberts, when he was younger, the 400 wasn't out then, but whatever he was on. Yeah. Um, you know, it fits a lot of those kids that you see in uh, the nationals now here in America. So, mm -hmm. and I'm sure the same goes for over the sea over the seas over the over the high seas or yeah the pond absolutely i mean it, you can yeah. almost if you can be good on a small bike like you can grow up on it and <laughs> it feels like it's like yeah you, you see some of the, these guys on on bikes you I mean like the mini motos and just like the super motos yeah. and you're like throwing it around the corner it's like those bikes don't have horsepower for days those riders just know how to throw them around. Yeah, I mean, the Supermoto doesn't have a lot of power, but if you look at, like, a 450 on a go-kart mm -hmm. track, I mean, it's kind of like... It's kind of similar to a 1,000 on a big track. Hmm. I mean, things wants to flip over backwards at the corner exit. It's it's good times. Yeah. Um, but um, wh who's your um, who's your go-to rider? Like, who, who are you, like, the biggest fan of right now? Um, so I've always been for whatever reason, maybe it was because my first bike was a Yamaha. I've always yeah. been a Yamaha guy. Okay. First and foremost, I've got this Yamaha jacket. In the, in You're just saying that because you know, I'm a Yamaha guy. Well, maybe. No, actually <laughs> not. I have this crazy, I, I have this crazy leather motorcycle jacket that I bought when I was 19 and I was in Barcelona and they had this leather Yamaha blue jacket and it matched my blue Yamaha that I had at the time. Um, and I've barely worn it. It's too big. I should have never bought it. Um, <laughs> but so I've always been kind of a Yamaha guy. So when Fabio Quattararo came into MotoGP, it was super exciting. He was exciting immediately. Yeah. And yeah. I became a big Fabio fan. Obviously, they're having a tough time over at Yamaha. Yeah, they are. But um, I mean, it's like it's it's like you can see the dude has such brilliance. Yeah. And it's like the he's just not getting what he needs to yeah. get going, you know? Yeah. It's, it's sad. And it's, and I don't know, 
it's one of those things because like, if you look at like MotoGP riders' careers and like the window you have to be great and be at the top is pretty small, right? And, and Mark has kind of said that moving to Ducati of like, listen, I can't wait for Honda to figure it out. Like, I'm just going to waste. He's like, I'm 30. I, I'm just going to waste these right. years. I, I have to do something. And I think Fabio feels the same way. But look at the last race. Everyone's saying Fabio's going to go to Aprilia and all his problems will be solved. Right. All the Aprilias finished behind Fabio at Portimao, guys. Everyone, right. Maverick broke down. I get it. He was running in second. <laughs> But you have to finish the race in order to score points. He did not. All the other Prilias are behind Fabio. So going right. to Aprilia is not magic. It's not a it, guarantee that you're still... going to be a, uh, in the hunt for the title like uh, Spargo was. Yeah. You know? Yeah, there's no guarantee. So it's it's when everyone's like, did, ah, you, see, did you see that shit? Like the, the announcers were really quick to think he was celebrating early. Yeah, and I didn't see that at all because he's sticking. Because that looked like he had a problem. It looked like he was breaking down, and it was like, I that, don't know. That annoyed the hell out of me because I'm I'm looking at it, and I'm like, well, he's sticking his leg out, warning anyone behind him that he's having an issue. Like, right. he's not sticking his leg out as like, yeah, the race is finished. Yeah, like I'm like, what? Yeah, like, I get it. We're gonna call back to Alicia. He was kind of back. motioning on the bike, like, what the fuck? Yeah, you know, like you know how those. Like you could say, see those Spaniards on TV. They get all emotional and yelling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He, he was gonna get fired under the helmet, and then it spit him off. And he was like, "Well, right. I guess, I guess that's the right. end of my little temper tantrum." He yeah. handled it. He handled it pretty well in the post race stuff. But uh, yeah, he did. And, but and, we were all like scratching our heads, like, "What the fuck happened?" It looked like the thing just. It looked like he was in neutral, and it popped into gear all of a sudden and flicked him off. Oh, well, I heard that, or he had like a brake problem. I couldn't tell, and but I guess it's a gearbox problem, right? So I saw something today and I didn't get a chance to read all of it, but he, apparently he was saying something. He was having trouble with fifth and sixth gear the whole race. Right. And it wasn't right. popping into gear correctly. And then the gear, he's like, please went. get in the gear, please get in the gear. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, man, that guy was wrestling that bike or fighting for the lead of a race while his bike was malfunctioning under him after every, in every gear change. Like that's crazy. Yeah. And um, where the fuck did he come from? Because like that dude's been like captain qualifier for years. He's been like nowhereville in the races and then yeah. this weekend he was like right there dude so he i used to love the vignali rossi yamaha like like they weren't competitive as far as titles going but like they were a lot of fun to watch i thought they were you have like two you have like you know the greatest motorcycle racer of all time next to this young upstart maverick vignales so i was always a vignales fan but he is so like you never know yeah. You never know what you're going to get from weekend to weekend. He's, I, right. I think it's sad to say, I think he's a little bit of a head case. Yeah. And, and, and he a showed bit, that little at bit. Yamaha. Yeah. yeah. And he might be like trying to figure it out, but I think he's like, dude, you got yeah. some emotional and like mental things that you need to like really get a hold of. Right. Because it just, I was feels surprised, like, dude. Yeah. I was surprised to see him at the front. Yeah. And in yeah. Brent and the main race. And like, it feels like he's definitely at least, as it's from people outside looking in, have has, has rededicated himself to MotoGP, but we've also heard that before. Yeah, so, yeah. I, well, well, we'll wait and see on that one. What do you think about the kid, baby, baby Jeebus? I mean, right? exciting. I don't, I don't love, I don't love overhyping. Like it drives me nuts in other sports. I mean, like right. the meme of like you know Chris Collinsworth can't not mention Patrick Mahomes' name when he talks about any racer or any any football player, and it's it's getting to that with like Pedro Acosta, where yeah. Anytime the conversation comes up, it's just it ends and begins at Acosta, which is like it gets a little tiring. Yeah. But then also you got that here in the Moto America, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. I think like we like to talk about Josh Heron a lot. No, Kayla Yakov, man. Like well, that too. I mean 16 year old. She is a badass. No, I I like I like Kayla, but they're they're also like like presenting her as if she the things she's doing has never been done before and i think right. that's where my issue lies on both sides yeah. of like no people have been riding motorbikes for a long time and people have been outstanding on motorbikes for a long time yeah so to claim that it was kind of neat seeing uh what happened to rossi when marquez kind of got going happening to marquez like almost the same way like just yeah it's know, very similar it's very last, similar. Yeah. Like All, you could see it's like the beginning of the end. The kid is coming out and, you know. Yeah. I think he's fun to watch. I mean, if anything else, like the fact that he just takes it to the big guys. Yeah. 
And he's also been in that paddock for a very long time. And so like, I remember Jack Miller, like two years ago was talking about riding production bikes with Pedro. And like, he's like, the, the kid's good. Like, like I can, yeah. I can learn stuff from this dude. And this is yeah. like, you know, he you said, know. did you see, he said that he, uh, he maybe needs to take Pilates. I was like, what the so fuck? here's what MotoGP needs. Here's what I'm trying to do with MotoGP is so Jack Miller, love him or hate him on the track. He's our, he's our Valtteri Botas. He's the okay. guy that we need to come out with a Jack Miller Pilates workout video. Oh my God. As a companion to getting people into the sport of MotoGP, just like Valtteri's doing all this crazy stuff. Dude, <laughs> that, that would, that, that is like Instagrammable of like the Jack Miller, wow. <laughs> bring your motorcycle Dude, to yoga day. That guy would probably do it too. Fuck yes, he, he would. He would definitely do that. Jack Miller, bring your bike to yoga day and just like fill a yoga studio with motorcycles and have Jack Miller teaching a yoga class. Oh my God. That would like, be so funny. Like that would be, that would be killer. And like, it's not motorcycle racing. That's going to bring people into motorcycle racing as sad as that is. Like it'll yeah. bring in a certain type. Well, but you see, you see how that Netflix show has driven a huge amount of popularity to formula one from the U S anyway. I don't know about the rest of the world, but yeah, the US, I mean, that show really has, I mean, I hear the kids, some of the kids at work even talk about it and they're like PR yeah. bunnies. Right? So I, I, I introduced, I watched the show. I thought drive to survive was fantastic. And I, yeah. And I, but I still don't, I don't watch formula one. I can't sit through races. I just, Oh, I, hell no. Why I like do I want to watch that when I could watch a season on Netflix at the end? Like, yeah. Who cares? <laughs> so, but I recommended that show to a few friends and, and a couple of them, like, like women who had never thought to get into motorsport. And now right. they're just rabid fans because they know all the characters. They know the drama. When you say Gunther Steiner, they know what that means. <laughs> and they think it's hilarious and they think it's controversial. And, and, oh my God, and he's married to a spice girl. And then the German guy doesn't like, and it's like, it's like, dude, this is, this is like what MotoGP needs. It's, it's, it's the characters. It's the drama. It's all this stuff. That's not just the racing, the product in MotoGP and world Superbike is a good product it's fun to watch it's exciting right. but if you again if you don't know anything about it the sport is boring just like every right. other sport. like cricket is insanely boring to us the way that baseball is insanely boring to anyone watching cricket and i was trying to explain to a south african it's the same sport <laughs> and yeah. baseball is the same amount of boring as cricket is you just understand one and don't understand the other that's it right it's the only difference yeah i i i see that i definitely see that and so that I think it totally makes sense. I really had high hopes for that Amazon show for MotoGP and it was so bad. It well, was... the, I mean, it started out, it was like not in English. So that caused some yeah. problems, right? Yeah, that was horrible, horrible marketing. Uh, and then it, and then it kind of got better. And I mean, truthfully, my wife is like super into MotoGP now because of Jorge Martin on that fucking show. Oh, interesting. And yeah. it also, you know, for me personally, like I was never an Aspargaro fan. But then after that show, it's like, shit, dude, you get to see how passionate the dude is and how like he's like, motherfucker, you know, and I love that shit. So I mean, I think they need to lean into all of that more. Yeah. And I think MotoGP does a very bad job where Formula One and even NASCAR, to a certain extent, do a very good job of of monetizing their personalities and right. getting the personalities. You don't have to be fighting for the world championship to be a personality and grow people to the sport like. Honestly, Valtteri Bottas's TikTok has gone off with these Uber, Uber share um, ads, <laughs> and this like it's there's I don't care about Formula One. He that is so fucking funny, really. And it's like it's just he doesn't take himself too seriously. He's like, guys, my name is Valtteri Bottas, and I have a fucking mullet, and I'm gonna wear my man hammock around the pat. Like it's just like he's just like embracing this kind of like goofball thing, right. and. We don't have that in MotoGP because they're just they don't market it. Like Jack Miller's a crazy person. He's yeah, a, I mean, he, I mean, in Moto America, we kind of have that crazy person in the guy you mentioned earlier. Yeah, he kind of um, gets that's. I think that's what I said. Like when people talk yeah. about stories, like you, you see, you hear his name first a lot. Because yeah, I mean, he's the guy that he's the stuff. guy that'll pull off on the edge of the track after crashing or whatever, and and go and a fan will hand him a diet Coors through the fence and he'll yeah. drink it on TV. <laughs> yeah. And like, that's <laughs> what know? the sport needs. Like the sport needs yeah. balance. It needs a right. good product on the track, but also 
like the thing that's great about Moto America, when you go to the events, like you said, you have so much access, you can walk down pit lane. I saw this little oh, yeah. girl had her slip on exhaust from her dad's bike and all the riders were signing the slip on. Right. And that's freaking cool. That's what makes memories. And that's what makes people want to do the sport. Not just, yeah, the- I mean, Jake, Jake does this thing where if he doesn't want to take the trophies home. He'll like give his trophy to some kid. Yeah. Like he'll win the thing, win the race, whatever, walk down and hand some kid his Dunlop hat and or his trophy or both or whatever. Yeah. And that is the coolest thing ever. I mean, the look on the little kid's face when he gets this huge trophy that's almost as big as he is. Yeah. You know, like, you know, that kid's going racing and he's going to basically blame Gagne for that shit. You know, absolutely. I love that. I love that. We are. at, at Laguna Seca last year is like Michael Hill, who does the kind of pit lane report yeah. stuff. He pulled, it was like a, a bunch of the Revit twins. I think it was, it was Rocco and it was Gus Rodeo Gus and maybe Rodeo. Blake Davis. Maybe it was okay. those three. And he yeah. kind of pulled them up for like this thing like impromptu karaoke thing. And then promptly started giving away all their team swag. Like he like literally right. took Rocco's hat. Oh took, yeah. Took Gus's sunglasses. Yeah. Took, that dude was, is notorious for that. He was just pulling it, peeling their, and like, you can tell like the kids who are watching are just like, like this kid was just right. sitting there and he had all of the gear on. Yeah. And they're like, can I have my hat back? Cause this is the only <laughs> one of those I have. I'll give you like, I'll give you two knee sliders. And they were like negotiating so yeah. give two knee sliders and a this and a that and a water bottle. But I need that hat back. It's the only one I have. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, I've seen Michael Hall take, uh, I don't know if you know who the CFE guys are. Have you seen those guys? Mm-mm. They're the lunatics that like, create a ruckus at the podium celebrations during Moto America Superbike Regan. Okay. They, they look like a team. Like it's, they're wearing like blue Yamaha shit. It says it's yellow and it says CFB right here. Okay. You know, so those guys, Michael Hall was walking around a couple years ago and took one of their hats and was like walking around wear a dude's hat. Yeah. Yeah. He's kind <laughs> of a nut. I, I, I enjoy it. Yeah. So Right on. Well, um, man, we're uh, we're in like an hour and twenty, bro. A little Shoot. after an hour twenty. No wonder my. I, I'm my sitting board. there talking, and I'm like, "Shit, dude, we could go for another hour," but I'm like, "Nah, yeah, not doing that." We'll do it. But, we'll do uh, it another time. Yeah, it's been a good chat, dude. You definitely are switched on with MotoGP. A um, little disappointed that you're not like into the track thing yet, but uh, I think I'm gonna work on changing that. Yeah, I mean, that's I'll give you all of... kinds of shit to talk about on your show. Um, Absolutely. After absolutely yeah, yeah i have i have stories about that for another time that i've of, of the opportunities that have been robbed for me because of work work yeah well call in sick like i said um so here's what's gonna happen for uh april 26th you're gonna come to button willow and we're gonna take you through the program the 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 track days crew is gonna basically show you the way um you're probably gonna get a two-up ride with this guy okay. um a spirited two-up ride um and then See how see how it goes for you, man. Cool. Well, we'll have to keep change in touch. your life. You're gonna I'm, change I'm, your life right now, I'm dude. Totally down. I'm totally down. Right. Especially if it's giving me content. I mean, come on. Like that's what it's all about. At the end of the day. Oh yeah, that's uh, content, uh, content, content, content. Right. That's kind of where yeah. I'm at too. Right. Um, yeah. But yeah, man, it's been a good chat, dude. Nice to meet you too, man. Like I've been seeing your TikToks and your podcast shit, and I'm like, man, I gotta talk to this dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And every, everyone out there watching and land, come join the uh, the the horsepower rodeo family. We're uh, we're trying to grow a little little something here. And, yeah, uh, uh, you just search for on YouTube. Just search for horsepower rodeo and TikTok. Yeah, I'll, I'll put TikTok, t- TikTok. I'll edit the video and I'll I'll put a link to your TikTok and shit in the description yeah, of the video yeah. so people could come check it out on TikTok and and YouTube. It's all at horsepower rodeo. And okay. I don't usually use Instagram very much, so don't even bother that at the moment. Yeah, I'm kind of like peeling off a little bit from that. I use Instagram a ton, and it's just like, it's a lot, dude. Yeah. Like, YouTube's kind of been more fun. TikTok's more fun, too. I don't know. We'll yeah, I, I find the format just easier to to use for my technological impaired brain. Technological impaired brain, and you sit there and talk about, like, super techie shit with MotoGP. <laughs> uh, I am a contradiction of terms, if nothing else. Well, I mean, do you have any uh, any last words about uh, about the sport, about the podcast, uh, about anything like that? Um, no, just everyone in Moto Land, feel free to reach out and be friends because that's what it's been about. I, I say it a lot on the the channel, and I don't know if people really believe me because everyone's just trying to search for followers. But I don't buy followers. I don't. 
um, you know, do just trying to get numbers. Like I want followers and want people involved that want to reach out like this and they want yeah. to talk and they want to talk about motorbikes and they want to yeah, keep up and they want to come up to Laguna Seca and sit in the grandstand. I'm going to put a banner up. This is horsepower rodeo. If they let me, um, okay. you know, just, just be a dork with a motorcycle. Um, so never be shy to come say hi, because I, I try to reply to basically everyone. And I've met some amazing people, present company included. Um, so um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Listen, I, you, you gave me $5 to say that. And then you want a question. Yeah. Right. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Right on. Well, dude, good chat, Ryan. And, um, man, I guess I'll see you at the track next month. Sounds good, man. I'll be there. Right. Right on, dude. Cool. All right. Peace Thanks out. for watching this crap too. Like if you like this stuff, please, everybody that's watching this or anybody that's going to watch this later, dude, do the thing, share it and comment and all that <laughs> like or whatever subscribe shit i don't know yeah all those <laughs> buzzwords it sounds it feels so weird even saying that dude but whatever. promotion is never wrong right right all right dude well i'll let you